In this section, we're going to be reading the first part of the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. As always in these exercises, we'll be focusing on the grammar and syntax of the passage, and this is a fairly straightforward prose section, so there shouldn't be too many difficulties. But for this section, we're also going to pay particular attention to what we might call the logic of the passage. That is, how the thought flows from point to point to point. And as we'll see, attending to the logic of the passage will help us clarify several interpretive issues. So, grab your copy of the Hebrew Bible, and let's get started. If we're going to understand how Exodus 20 functions within the literary framework of the book of Exodus, we have to spend a moment reviewing the context of this passage, and especially its relationship to the preceding chapters and how it lays a foundation for what follows in the covenant ceremony of chapter 24. Beginning with the departure from the shores of Yam Suf at the end of chapter 15, the Israelites experienced several crises in which God posed a series of tests for his people to see if they would keep his commandments or not, tests that they consistently fail. When we arrive at Mount Sinai at the beginning of chapter 19, God prepares them for the covenant ceremony that will formalize the relationship between him and the people by telling them that they will be his most prized possessions if they keep the terms of the relationship that he will spell out for them. They swear that they will, even though they haven't yet heard what those terms are. In chapters 20 to 23, God then spells out those terms. First come the principles that are to shape the life of the people of God. We're going to read the first portion of that passage in this session. By the way, you probably already know this, but the text never actually calls this material the Ten Commandments. The closest that it comes is a reference to the Ten Devarim, the Ten Words, or as I prefer to translate it, the Ten Principles. These Devarim, are principles that guide the life of the people of God. And then they're followed by a section, basically chapters 21 to 23, of what the text calls judgments. These judgments constitute the way that these 10 principles are to be implemented within the particular community of Israel in that place and in that time. All of this sets the stage for the formalization of the relationship in what is metaphorically presented as a marriage ceremony between Yahweh and his people in chapter 24, in what is commonly called the covenant ceremony. So that's how the Ten Commandments fit into the broader narrative context. And with that in mind, let's turn to the text. Verses 1 and 2 establish the foundation, or the basis, for the instruction that is to follow. Verse 1 is a very standard introductory formula. Wadaber Elohim et kal hadavarim ha'ele lemor. This is typical and a fairly straightforward bit of narrative prose, beginning with a subject-verb clause, wadaber Elohim, then God spoke, and concluding with an object clause, et kal hadavarim ha'ele, all these words. And lemor, of course, is an infinitive construct of means, telling us how God spoke. He spoke by saying. So putting verse 1 together, we would read the whole thing as simply, then God spoke all these words by saying. 
And as you know, it's quite common just to drop the phrase by saying, since it functions as a way for Hebrew to introduce a direct quotation. So it's often dropped because translations treat it functionally, and they turn it into a comma followed by quotation marks, which is the way that we introduce direct quotations in English. In the second verse, God establishes the basis for his teaching by reminding the Hebrews of his redeeming work in bringing them out of Egypt. The verse begins with an identification clause that establishes the relationship. Anoki Yahweh Elohecha, I am Yahweh your God. Then it continues with a relative clause that gives the reason that the people should attend to his teaching. Asher Hotsethika Me'eretz Mitzrayim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The verb here is a hyphial perfect first common singular from yatsa to go out or come out. Here, the hyphial turns this normally intransitive verb, yatsa, into a transitive verb, so that it takes an object in the form of the second masculine singular suffix, you. So, I brought you out, Me'eretz Mitzrayim, from the land of Egypt, or perhaps the land of the Egyptians. This is followed by an appositive, further defining the land of the Egyptians as Mibeth of Adim, from the house of slaves. In biblical Hebrew, the plural of nouns is sometimes used for an abstract idea. So here, the plural noun slaves could be read as the abstract concept slavery. And most English translations, including the ESV, take it that way. Though some use the gloss bondage instead of the gloss slavery, since the modern English reader is likely to take slavery to suggest the kind of chattel slavery that characterized the African slave trade of the 18th and 19th centuries. And that's probably not an accurate picture of the kind of oppression that the Israelites experienced. But that's an issue that's beyond the scope of our task here. Other translations, the New Jerusalem Bible, for example, simply render it as slaves. So, Putting it together, we might read verse 2 as, I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. As we said, verses 1 and 2 lay the foundation for the instruction that follows by defining the relationship between Yahweh and the Hebrews and establishing that the basis for that relationship lies in God's redeeming work. Verse 3 reads, Lo yihyelaka Elohim akerim al panai. Here there are really only two grammatical issues. The first is the question of what force to give the verbal phrase, Lo yihyelaka. In form, this is a negative particle, Lo, plus the call imperfect third masculine singular of the verb, Haya, to be or become. But this construction is used in more than one way in biblical Hebrew. The most common usage is the standard negative indicative. Now, grammarians use the term indicative to refer to statements or questions that deal with matters of fact. So if we read this as an indicative, we would render it as a statement of fact. You will not if we take it that way, we would be understanding God to be saying that as a consequence of their relationship, they simply will not worship any other gods, and that's a fact, Jack. The indicative is what in grammar we call a mood. The grammatical term mood refers to the shade of meaning associated with a particular form of the verb. And there are other verbal moods besides the indicative. For example, 
The imperative is a grammatical mood used to communicate requests or commands or advice. And Biblical Hebrew, as you know, has a separate imperative form. There are other moods that have distinct forms in Biblical Hebrew as well, the jussive, the cohortative, and the infinitive, for example. But no language has a separate form for every different mood or verbal sense. And in Biblical Hebrew, there are two important grammatical moods for which Hebrew does not have a distinctive form, the subjunctive mood and the optative mood. The subjunctive mood is used to express unreal or hypothetical situations, or possibilities that may or may not come about, or sometimes things that we fear or desire. The optative mood is used to express something that is wished for or longed for or expected to happen. The point is this. Since Hebrew lacks distinct forms for some of these moods, it simply uses the regular imperfect for them. When that happens, we typically refer to the imperfect as a modal imperfect. Now, that just means that the form is the form of a regular imperfect. But in that case, the imperfect, the regular imperfect, is being used to communicate the sense of one of those moods for which Hebrew does not have a separate form. In this case, given the context that we're working in, the most likely mood would be the optative mood, the sense of something that is expected. Or in this case, because it's negative, it would be something that it is expected will not happen. Taken that way, it would communicate a sense of what we might think of as a long-term prohibition, something that must not happen. That's why it's often translated with the force of a negative imperative. Now, given the instructional context here, the idea of a prohibition is probably to be preferred over the simple indicative. But to answer the question of how to handle this phrase, lo yelaka, we have three options. First, we could take this as a simple indicative. You will not have other gods. Second, we could take it as a modal imperfect with the sense of a negative imperative. Do not have other gods. Remember, while Hebrew has a separate form for the imperative, it doesn't use that form to communicate a negative command. So there is no dedicated form for the negative imperative. The third possibility is that we could take this as a modal imperfect with the sense of an optative. You must not have other gods. Obviously, the second and the third possibilities are pretty close in meaning, but they are slightly different and we should be aware of that difference and how we understand the text as we read it. Personally, I would be inclined to read this as an optative. In this case, I'd take it as a prohibitional sentence. You must not have other gods. In either case, the broader context makes it clear that this and all the instructions that follow are the principles that undergird the relationship that God intends to formalize with his people in the covenant. So I would be inclined to read this as, you must not have other gods, Elohim, Acherim, Al Panai. And this leads us to the second thing that we need to think about here. The most common English translation of this phrase, Al Panai, is before me. The problem is that in English, the word before can suggest the idea of sequence as well as the idea of proximity. But the particle al is not used in Hebrew for the sense of sequence. 
So the point here is not that it's okay to worship other gods as long as you put Yahweh first. The point is one of exclusivity. Yahweh does not want any other gods anywhere around him, period. By the way, the translators of the early Greek translation that we sometimes call the Septuagint understood this. They translated this into Greek as plain emu. You'd render that as you shall have no other gods for yourself except me. The point of the instruction is that Israel should worship Yahweh exclusively. Now, I like the English word besides as a gloss for the Hebrew al here because it combines the ideas of proximity and exclusivity. And so it has a range of meanings that's similar to that of the Hebrew word. Putting this all together, I would read verse 3, something like this. You must not have any other gods besides me. Verse 4 introduces a new thought. Lo ta'aselaka pesel. You must not make for yourselves a pestle. A pestle is an image of a deity, an idol. But more specifically, a pestle refers to a carved image. Now here it may be helpful to understand how statues of deities were made in the ancient world. Smaller idols were often cast images made of solid metal that was poured into a mold. An idol made in this way might be solid gold, or it might be some other metal like iron or copper that was then covered with gold leaf. Here's a cast metal image of the Canaanite deity, Baal. But most larger images of gods were carved out of wood, which was then overlaid with metallic leaf like gold leaf. This is a picture of a modern recreation of the statue of Athena that once stood in the Parthenon in Athens. The original of this was finished around 445 BC and was 37 feet tall. It was made of wood and then covered with bronze, which was then covered with gold leaf, at least for a while. The gold leaf was stripped off in 296 BC and used to pay the army at that time. Now, this statue is much larger than statues of deities that lived in temples in the ancient Near East, but the construction was similar. Many large cultic objects were made in this way. In fact, this is the way that the Ark of the Covenant was made in the Tanakh. It was carved from acacia wood and then covered with gold leaf. Only the lid, the kaporeth, was cast of solid metal. Similarly, the golden calf that the Israelites made in Exodus chapter 33 was made of carved wood that was then covered with gold leaf. But even though the word for a carved image is used here, the emphasis really isn't on the carved nature of the image. And the next phrase makes that clear by adding the words, wakal tumuna, or any likeness. The Hebrew tumuna refers to the physical likeness of a thing without any regard for how it's made. So while it's perfectly fine to translate the word pestle as a carved image, we wouldn't want to overemphasize the carved part. In this case, the point is simply that it's an image, a physical representation that serves as the manifestation of the presence of a deity to receive the worship of the people. And this is followed by three relative clauses that together expand on this thought of any likeness by making it all-inclusive. First, we have a share b'shamayim mima'al of anything which is in the sky above. Next, we have a share b'eretz mitaketh 
which is in the earth below. And then finally, what a share vamayim metaketh laaretz, or which is in the waters beneath the earth. The last phrase draws on the common cosmological understanding of the ancient world, that the land floated atop a vast underground sea. Actually, they mostly thought it, that it stood on pillars that supported above the underground sea. And that underground sea was thought to be the source of springs and well water. Putting all this together, we would read verse 4 as, You must not make for yourself a carved image or any other likeness of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters under the earth. There are two really significant questions related to this verse, and they're not grammatical or lexicographical in nature. And together they illustrate the importance of attending to the logic of the passage, the way that the thought of the passage develops. The first question is whether this verse was intended to prohibit the making of any artistic expression, whether a statue or some other form of artwork, of anything in the sky or on the earth or in the seas. That's how Islamic interpreters understand this verse, and how some in the early Christian church understood it as well. And to be fair, that seems to be what the words are saying. But here's where reading things in the context matters. All of Exodus chapter 20 from verse 1 to verse 11 deals with worship. And as verse 5 will make clear, the point of not making images is that the images should not be worshipped. So even though it may seem on the surface that verse 4 prohibits all representational art. Reading verse 4 in its context should help us to understand that God is not prohibiting his people from making any representational art. He's commanding them not to create any physical likeness to be used as objects to receive worship. The second important question related to this verse is referential. In other words, what does this refer to? Does this prohibition refer to the making of images of other gods only? Or does this also include a prohibition against making an image of Yahweh? Now, this is a more challenging question, at least on the surface. If we read this verse, as a continuation of the thought of verse 3, then we would probably say that it prohibits the making of images of other gods only. However, in light of other passages in the Bible, like Deuteronomy 4, where the commandment against images is directly connected to the fact that they did not see Yahweh on Mount Sinai, it becomes apparent that it was God's intention that the prohibition against images is not limited to images of other gods, but is intended to include a prohibition against the images of Yahweh as well. With that in mind, we should probably not read verse 4 as a continuation of the thought of verse 3, but as introducing an entirely new thought. We should probably take verses 5 and 6 together since they form a complete thought unit. Because this is a longer block, I think the thing to do is to read through it quickly first and then go back and look at some of the important details. So let's survey it. And to do this, I'm going to render it pretty stiff and literal at first. Lo tishtakawe lahim. You must not bow down to them. Walo ta'avdeim, and you must not worship them. Ki anuki Yahweh Eloheka el kana, because I, Yahweh your God, am a passionate God. Poketh awon avoth al banim, putting the punishment 
for the sins of the fathers upon the sons. Al Shalashim wa al Rivaim Lakshonai to the thirds and the fourths with respect to those who hate me. Wa Ose Hesed La Alafim La Ovai. But giving grace to thousands with respect to those who love me. Wa Shomri Mitzvothai and with respect to those who keep my commandments. Now, let's go back and look at some of the details. Lo tishtakawelahem walo ta'avdeim. You must not bow down to them, and you must not worship them. Here, as elsewhere, the hishtafel of the verb chawa, to bow down or do obeisance, is a synonym for worship. Avad, or sir, is also used here in the sense of worship. By the way, the use of avad as a synonym for worship highlights an important theological and spiritual point for us. When people talk about serving God, they often think of becoming a missionary or a pastor or perhaps doing good works by helping the church or taking care of their neighbor in need. And all of those are good and important things. But worship is the primary way in which we serve God. We should never lose sight of the fact that worship is our first and greatest service to God. The next clause provides the reason that we should worship Yahweh only. Ki anoki Yahweh aloheka el kana. This is a nominal sentence, a sentence without a verb. When we have a nominal sentence in Hebrew, we have to supply some form of the verb to be. Usually it's the present tense. But the question is where to insert it. We could insert it at the beginning and read this as, because I am Yahweh your God, a jealous God. And that works grammatically, but it sounds a little bit clumsy in English, especially when we put it together with what follows. So most people would probably take the phrase Yahweh your God as an appositive to the pronoun I, and they would insert the verb after that. So they would read it, because I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God. I want to say something about how we should understand the Hebrew term kana, usually translated jealous. This is one of those places where the connotation of words has to be taken into account when reading biblical Hebrew. For modern hearers, the word jealous has something of a negative connotation. It's not a desirable trait. So before we settle on jealous as a gloss for the Hebrew kana, we need to consider whether the Hebrew term kana has the same negative connotation that we associate with the English word jealous. So how do we do that? Well, if you were to go to Logos Bible Software and do a search for this term, you would find that the adjective form that's used here only occurs six times all in Exodus or Deuteronomy, and all referring to an aspect of God's character. So that's not all that helpful. To get a better idea of the concept, we have to look at other related words, at nouns and verbs from the same root, uh, and sort through their connotations as well. And if we did that, we would find that, yeah, Quite often, the words related to this word kana in biblical Hebrew do have the kind of negative connotation that we associate with the English word jealous. Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes these words have a more neutral or even a positive sense, something more like our word passion or zeal. For example, in 1 Kings 19 and in Isaiah 37, we have an example of one of these terms in this group of words, a noun, used to refer to God's character 
in a way that clearly has a positive connotation. We read, Out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and out of Mount Zion a group of survivors. The Cana of Yahweh will do this. In these verses and in other places in the Tanakh, it is Yahweh's Cana, his passion for his people, that moves him to take action to save them. My point is this. Like many theologically significant words in the Tanakh, Cana can have a gospel focus or a law focus, depending upon the context. And if we look ahead to the rest of this verse, we'll see that in this case, Yahweh's Cana moves him both to judge and to forgive. But, and this is the really important thing, the emphasis in this passage is on how vast God's forgiveness is compared to the extent of his judgment. So the focus here reflects both law and gospel, but the emphasis is primarily on the gospel. Here, kana is that emotional attachment that God has to his creation that moves him to send his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's why I would not translate kana here as jealous. It just doesn't communicate the right idea to the modern reader. Instead, I would render it with an English word that can have a range of connotations similar to that of the Hebrew word, something like zealous or perhaps passionate. So I might read this as, because I, Yahweh your God, am a passionate God. The rest of verse 5 and all of verse 6 together build on this thought by highlighting the way in which God's passion for his people manifests itself. We read, Poked avonavot al banim al al revaim le sonai wa ose chesed le elafim le ohavai u lishmore mitzvothai. This long phrase sets up a contrast between two different situations. Let's examine how this is put together. Each part of this has a verb and object clause. Pokez awon in the first part and ose chesed in the second part. So who's the recipient of this action? In the first part, it's albanim, and that phrase albanim is qualified by le sonai, upon the sons with respect to those who hate me. But what about the second part? There is no explicit parallel to albanim, upon the sons, in the second part. The reason that there's not an explicit recipient of the action in the second part, is that the recipient of the action in the second part is the same as the recipient of the action in the first part. Al-Banim does what we would call double duty as the recipient of both actions. God will show chesed to the sons designated by the qualifier la o havai to those who love me and keep my commandments. And finally, each phrase has an adverbial clause that indicates the extent of the activity. Al shaleshim wa al riveim in the first part, and the alafim in the second part. Notice that there's a contrast between each pair of these elements. The conjunction wow on wa-ose expresses this contrast. It is disjunctive. It signals the contrast between the two sections. So keeping in mind that the point of the passage is in the contrast, let's look at each of these phrases. We start with, Pokeda wona voth albanim 
wa'al shleishim wa'al rivayim lasonai. The verb is the call participle of the root pe kof dalet, pakad. The traditional translation of this is visit, but that's kind of a poor choice here. This root is used in a variety of senses in the Tanakh. It does sometimes mean to visit in the sense in which we commonly use that word in English today. In other places, it has the sense of paying attention to something or observing something or even carefully examining something. In other places, it's used for attending to something or taking care of something. And in still other places, it has the idea of putting something someplace or assigning someone to a position. It's probably this idea of putting something somewhere that leads to the idea of punishment. So here, I think I would read this word simply as put. What is God going to put? He's going to put the awon of the fathers. Awon is a commonly used word for iniquity or sin or transgression, but it's also used for things that are related to the sin. For example, it's sometimes used to refer to the guilt that's associated with sin. In other places, it's used for the punishment or perhaps the consequences associated with sin. So how do we determine with which sense it's being employed here? The answer, of course, is that we look at the context. Looking at the context, we see that here, a wound is used to establish the contrast with chesed in the next phrase. Chesed is used here to refer to that undeserved favor of God that moves him to forgive sins. So here, a wound refers to what God does when he does not forgive sins. It refers to the punishment for sin. There are two other things that we need to talk about here. One is the numbers used in this verse, thirds, fourths, and thousands. And the other is the words that qualify the recipients. Let's start with the qualifying words first, and then look at the significance of the numbers. In both parts of this, the recipient of God's actions are the sons, but the sons are qualified. Notice that it's not just any son or every son that God will punish, but specifically the sonai, with respect to those who hate me. The point is this. God is not arbitrarily going to punish every son for the sins of his fathers. That's not what the verse says. Rather, the judgment of God will come upon those who hate him, those who persist in being God's adversary and opposing him. By contrast, God shows chesed, and here I think I'd translate chesed as grace, since it refers to that aspect of God's character that moves him to forgive sins. God shows grace to those sons Lahovai walishmorai mitzvothai, to those sons who love me and keep my commandments. So the qualifying phrases are really important if you want to understand correctly what God is saying here. And this brings me to the significance of the numbers used in these verses, thirds, fourths, and thousands. As the contrast makes clear, we're talking in each case about the sons of the fathers. The use of the plural indicates that these numbers are talking about groups of sons of the fathers. And when we talk about groups of sons following fathers, we use the word generation in English. The Hebrew word for generation is door, but it doesn't actually occur anywhere in this text. Now, most English translations get the sense of this right 
when they're talking about the thirds and fourths. So they normally translate that as third and fourth generation. That is the third and fourth group of sons of the fathers. And that's right. But unfortunately, most English translations miss the point when they get to the word thousands. We should read this as God will show grace to the thousandth generation. That is the thousandth group of sons of the fathers to those who love him. We know that this is the correct understanding of the passage because the same thought is expressed in slightly different words in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 7, in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 15, and in Psalm 105, verse 8. And in all of those places, the word for generation, the word for the Hebrew, the Hebrew word door, does occur explicitly in the Hebrew text. Why does this matter? It matters because the point of the passage is to emphasize how vast the extent of God's grace is. His eternal, perpetual, thousand-generation reaching grace when compared to the limited extent of his punishment of sin. That's the Bible's way of saying what dogmatic theologians try to communicate by saying that showing mercy is God's proper work and punishing sin is his alien work. Israel's God is and always remains a just and righteous God. He will punish sin if we persist in it and make ourselves enemies of his love for us. But he longs and desires to show mercy. His chesed, his steadfast and undeserved love lasts forever. This understanding of God is the constant refrain of the psalmist, especially the author of Psalm 136. The reason that this is so often repeated in the Old Testament is that this is the central teaching of the Old Testament. Those fools who say that the God of the Old Testament is a God of law and judgment and punishment, and the God of the New Testament is a God of gospel and forgiveness, they have either never read the Old Testament, or they're too stupid to understand what they've read. And it's unfortunate that the poor translation of this verse has contributed to so much false teaching. God's thousand-generation saving grace is yours to receive, to live in, and to share with others. So to wrap up verses 5 and 6, we should read them as a single thought unit, referring back to the images being worshipped. You must not worship them or serve them because I, Yahweh your God, am a passionate God, putting the punishment for the sins of the fathers upon the sons to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but giving grace to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commands. So that brings us to the end of our text for this session. I hope you can see how important it is to attend to the ways that words are used in the context and how the thought of a passage develops as it unfolds. I'm Dr. David Adams. Thank you for joining me as we read the Tanakh together in its original Hebrew, and I hope you'll come back soon and continue to grow with me as a faithful reader and steward of the Word of God. Thank you.